Greetings, and welcome to worship at Grand Avenue United Methodist Church. My name is David, and I have privilege of being the pastor to the folks that call this place their spiritual home. On their behalf and in the name of Jesus Christ, we welcome you. As you prepare to worship with us today, bring something of beauty into the space where you are, like these flowers that have been given to the glory of God and in loving memory of their son, Cody, by Joe and Carol Peters on what would have been his birthday. Light a candle wherever you may be to remind yourself that you stand in the presence of the living Christ, whose light dispels our darkness and whose fire enkindles love in each of us. I have good news today. That is that our relaunch team has met this past week and updated their plans for our return to in-person worship. There should be an announcement coming soon. Watch this space and our latest newsletter. As we worship today, the words that you need to join us will appear on your screen, but there's likewise a link in the comments and description with this video. There you will be able to register your attendance and share a prayer concern with us if you would like. I particularly draw your attention to a prayer concern that I have today. A member of our congregation, Donna Martin, has died this past week, and so I'm lighting this candle this morning in her memory. And I ask that you will join with me in praying for her family and for all who will miss her the most. If there are prayer concerns that you have, you will find also in that same link a way that you can share prayer concerns with us. And if you'd like to receive updated prayer requests from Grand Avenue, you can contact us by email. As we worship today, our worship is centered on the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Jesus reminds us through telling this story that for those of us who have only late come to the faith or for those who have been long time members of the family of God, that God's grace is the same. All of it is available to all of us all of the time. I'd ask your prayers for that grace to fall in places where people's lives are being disrupted. We see the fires that are burning on the West Coast, the storms that are still brewing along the East Coast and along the Gulf. I ask your prayers for the people, not only whose lives are being devastated by those fires and storms, but those who are hurrying to help them. I likewise ask you to pray for the political process that is uh, building day by day and the heated animosities that there are sometimes between people. Pray that the peace of Christ will prevail over all. And let us pray for all who have any need anywhere. Will you join me in prayer? Lord of justice and mercy, we quibble over perceived little injustices. We look around us and see mercy being offered to others when we feel that they've done little to merit such treatment. Our world is in such bad shape. There are true injustices and horrible situations in which peace and mercy seem to be dim and distant hopes. Give us eyes to see where justice and compassion may be offered. Give us hearts to reach out to those who are new in faith and who struggle in life. Enable and strengthen each one of us in your service, that we may offer peace and hope to others, not counting the cost, but sharing the wealth of your mercy and love. It is in the name of Jesus who teaches us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, friends, let us rejoice as we sing together, Jesus Loves Me.
Good morning, children of God. Several years ago, I told my son Andrew that he needed to find a summer job. And he looked at me and said, how do I do that? I was sort of surprised that he had no idea. And well, being the old fashioned person I am, I said, well, you get the newspaper and you go to the classified ads and you look at the job help wanted ads. Well, actually I've looked at these and there are hardly any listed here. But down here in the corner, there's a big ad that says, go to this website to look for jobs in Arkansas. So nowadays, most people go to their computer or they pull out their phone and call up a website and they can look for jobs. They can even make the application for the job right on their phone. So it's a lot different searching for a job now than it used to be. How about you? Have you thought about what job you would like? What would be the ideal job for you? Would you like to be president? Or maybe an award-winning actor or actress? Hmm, an interesting job might be to be a taster of new ice cream flavors. Let's see, what would the qualifications for this job be? Well, you would need an acute sense of taste, a willingness to try new things, an awareness of a product pleasing to the eye. And another qualification would be the ability to work on a team and be a leader. Because you might have to tell a worker that the new flavor was not acceptable. Now, even though a job might sound ideal, there's often more to a job than meets the eye. How about if Jesus put up a help wanted sign? What qualifications would you need to do a job for Jesus? Well, one thing is you'd have to be willing to help people by giving your time or your money to the church. I was thinking about that because there's a sign on this desk here in the lay ministry office that says, I don't work here. Well, in a way, I don't work here because I don't get paid to be here and do anything. But I spend a lot of time at the church doing things to help the church minister to other people. Another thing that you might need to do to work for Jesus is to remember that you should always be honest, to tell the truth in every situation. And another qualification would be that you have to stand up for what is right. Do you think that you're qualified to work for Jesus? We need workers at Grand Avenue United Methodist Church, especially at this time now. We may be coming back to in-person worship soon, and we need people who will be willing to greet people at the door and give instruction on how to come into the church and where to sit. We need people who are willing to clean things. And I don't know if there are any jobs that can be done by children, but I know that you can always pray for the church. That's one of the most important jobs that we have. So let's pray now. Dear God, help us to be good workers for you and your son, Jesus. Amen. In your relationships with others, if someone bestows a kindness on you, how do you respond? I spent some time today thinking about how I thank others. I usually show gratitude through actions as well as words. I might give words both orally and by sending a thank you note or a thank you card, or give a hug, or give a smile, or give a gift, or give of my time, or give a favor. The key word here is give. Through my giving, I'm showing gratitude and thankfulness. I believe that the same is true of my relationship with God. Through my giving, I'm showing God that I'm grateful for his abundant grace and blessings. Everything that I have comes from God. Because I love him, I want to support his church. So I give my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, and my witness to support the ministries of Grand Avenue by building faith, bringing hope, and reaching out in love. Won't you join me in expressing gratitude through joyful giving as our choir sings 10,000 Reasons.
The scripture today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 to 16, the laborers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went out, and when he went out again about noon, and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, 
Why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you made them equal to us who have done the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of Holy Scripture. Will you join me in an attitude of prayer? Let us pray. O oh God, as you have graciously made yourself available to us in Jesus Christ, graciously receive us as we make ourselves available to you in his name. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. For unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken. Give us your word, Lord Jesus. And let the people of God say, Amen. Well, it just isn't fair, is it? Any way you slice it, it just isn't fair. People are hired at all hours of the day. Some come in at sunup, others mid-morning, some at about noon, and others not until about an hour before closing time. And yet, they're each paid exactly the same amount. And to make matters worse, Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is going to be like that. To be truthful, we don't expect life to be fair. We've lived long enough and we've seen enough pain and suffering to know that sometimes the brightest and best of us seem to get the short end of the stick. And others who seem to be least deserving get the biggest breaks. Life isn't fair. We may not like it, but we know it's true, and somehow or another we manage to adjust. What deeply troubles us is the opening phrase of Jesus' parable, the kingdom of heaven is like. We don't expect life to be fair, but surely we can expect God to be fair, and yet this parable seems to suggest quite the contrary, that God is not fair. The vineyard owner of this tale pays everybody the same amount, without respect to the number of hours that they worked. Obviously, this vineyard owner doesn't know very much about human nature. Can't he see that the next time he goes out to hire workers, those who worked all day long are going to wait and come at about five o'clock in the afternoon? Remember, they stood at the back of the line when settling up time came. They saw the unfairness of the owner. They knew that even though they worked all day, they didn't get any more than the people who were Johnny-come-latelys. So next time, they'll be smart. Doesn't the vineyard owner realize this? He can't operate a successful business this way. Surely he doesn't understand very much about human nature. And if this vineyard owner is supposed to represent God, well, then we've got a real problem on our hands. Because no one would suggest that God doesn't understand about human nature. But if God really is as gracious as this parable suggests, and as unfair, if God really does go around passing out grace and goodies without respect of how much or how little we've worked, then God's about to have a little bit of trouble, at least with some of us. Because, well, when people begin to discover this and believe it, some of us will abuse it, and others, well, we might abandon the church altogether. Sometimes God seems to be so wishy-washy, and people will take advantage of that. I mean, after all, it's just a few short weeks until our stewardship campaign, a time when we're going to ask people to 
uh, remember and even increase their pledge to the church in terms of prayers and presence, gifts and service and witness. How can we talk about God who is unfair and rewards people without respect to their efforts and then expect them to live up to those commitments and perhaps even increase them? If Jesus really means it when he says that the kingdom of God is like that, then God's about to have some trouble, at least with some of us. Because some of us have tried to make a deal with God. We've said, we will do this and that for God if in return God will do the other thing for us. We've treated our relationship with God like a contractual arrangement. Thus, we try to follow Christ only because we think that we will thereby reap some rewards. But one day, probably sooner rather than later, we're going to look up from our position at the back of the line and we're going to discover that somebody else who exerts much less effort than we do seems to be getting the same rewards that we are. If this parable really means that God doesn't operate a system of fairness, then God's got a problem with some of us. Our loyalty is going to last only as long as God's rewards keep coming our way. But if, what if instead of living our lives by merit, we live by grace? Then this parable is good news because grace reminds us that God's favor is always a gift. Remember that the problem in this text is not the injustice of a mean and cruel landowner. The problem is the scandal of a gracious and loving God. Verse 15 asks, are you envious of me because of my generosity? One of the most harmful sins that we can commit as children of God is that of envy, begrudging someone else the same grace and favor that we long for, for ourselves. Many of us, maybe even most of us, identify with the employees who put in a full day's work rather than those who were johnny come latelys We like to think of ourselves as responsible workers and the employer's uh, strange behavior, well, it kind of baffles us. But let's not miss the point. God dispenses gifts, not wages. If it's wages that we want, Paul's letter to the Romans makes it abundantly clear. The wages of sin is death. But if we want to receive what God freely wants to give us, then the last part of that verse offers us something far better than compensation. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's favor is a gift. Let me share with you two thoughts. Two truths that can radically change the way that you see yourself in relationship to God and the way that you live your life. The first one is this. There is nothing that you can do that will make God love you any more than God loves you right now. And the second is like it. There's nothing that you can do that will make God love you any less. The only thing that you can do is to receive God's love, God's favor, God's grace as a gift. And here's a second truth. Grace keeps us from looking down on ourselves. If the parable that Jesus told really is a metaphor for the kingdom of heaven, then God may also have a problem from another group. Think about those people who are standing at the front of the line. Isn't it interesting that they never accused the vineyard owner of being unfair, even though it was abundantly clear that they got far more than they actually deserved? Maybe they're silent because it never occurred to them to compare themselves with anyone else. Then also there's the possibility that they never expected to be treated fairly. Maybe they don't even want to be treated fairly. Does anybody? I mean, do you? Does anybody want to live in a world and with a God who is absolutely fair? Do we really want to receive only what we deserve from our family, from our friends, from God? I don't want only what I deserve of love or forgiveness or kindness. I don't really want everything to come out even. Do you? I don't want God to be fair. What I want and what I think we all want is for God to be generous. What we want is to be surprised now and again with gifts that we haven't earned, 
and with rewards that we could never merit. Which reminds me of a third truth. And that is this, that grace makes us equal to everyone else. The worker's complaint in verse 12 always fascinates me. You have made them equal to us. The all-day workers didn't complain about their wages. They knew that what they received was generous. They're upset because they wanted to be superior to everyone else. And the word that's used to describe what they do, grumbling, it's in the imperfect tense, which is to say that they didn't do it just once. They were in a constant state of grumbling, which helps us to see what kind of workers they really were. They weren't only dissatisfied with what they themselves had received, they were also envious of what had been given to others. There's a part of us that wants God to give us grace so that we can compare ourselves to others. Do you ever build yourself up by putting others down? If so, notice the tragic chain of events that happens in this story. They begin by comparing themselves to others, and that leads to coveting, which leads to complaining, which leads to criticizing. So if you ever struggle with criticism, with complaints, with coveting, then stop comparing yourself to others. God declares that in the economy of grace, we're all equal. And the truth is, if God is fair, if God only gives us what we earn or deserve, then we're all in serious trouble. For who among us can look at our life and find there a generous measure of Christ's likeness? And who can look deep within without discovering much ugliness which merits far less grace than we've experienced? Which one of us can truthfully say that she or he has been in the vineyard all day long, from sunup to sunset, working constantly and with absolute commitment? Maybe one or two of us can, but not many more than that. And so, whether or not we want God to be fair is related to where we stand in life, which is to say that it depends upon our personal perspective. Those who think that they are far better than others and therefore deserve better than they get want God to be fair. Those of us who know that we've received better than we deserve are glad, glad that God is not fair. Rather than griping about God's unfairness, we simply rejoice in God's generosity. Which reminds me of the ultimate truth, which is that grace offers us a fresh start. You see, God gave up on salvation by the book and quit keeping score about 2,000 years ago, gathered up all of our IOUs, marked them paid in full, and nailed them to the cross of Calvary. The only way to get saved is to accept the invitation to the party, to forget about accounting and let God be as reckless and as generous and as discriminate with grace as God wants to be. Do you know the most scornful and derisive thing that the scribes and Pharisees could say about Jesus? It was, this man eats and drinks with sinners. He'll party with anybody. He'll have fun with the riffraff and the losers. As Tony Campolo says, the kingdom of God is a party. And the guest list includes some pretty shady characters, people like you and like me. Finally, our only hope, no matter what time we arrived at our work in the vineyard, our only hope is that Jesus will continue to party with the riffraff and drink with the sinners and love the losers. You see, nobody gets more of God's love than anyone else. Each one of us, we get it all. I guess it finally comes down to this. You can demand to get what you deserve, or you can place yourself totally at the mercy of a loving and gracious and extravagant God. And I don't know about you, but I'm taking grace and singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Friends, we thank you for worshiping with us today. It will be only a few short weeks before we return to in-person worship here in this space. But we will continue to post services online because we know that not everyone will be willing or able to join us. Please know that wherever you are, we pray that God will be with you until we meet again. Amen.